Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome all of you to uh, this uh, conference, Reflections on Japanese Modernism. Um, the, the background of, uh, of this conference probably goes back in some ways uh, to uh, a few years ago because uh, um, it, it probably has to do something with the intertwining of some of my interests and then uh, having the, the pleasure to meet Ken uh, Tadashi Oshima, who will be speaking later on. Um, I uh, visited Japan a few times and, and noticed really some of the remarkable work of, of uh, Japanese architects, some of whom uh, were uh, known uh, because of their connection specifically to, uh, to Le Corbusier, but maybe others who uh, were not so much. And it seemed that it would be a wonderful opportunity to really try and study and, and promote the, the development of, of, uh, of modernism. And then, of course, I came across the work of uh, uh, Ken, uh, Ken uh, some years ago, and we started discussing the possibility of an exhibition and the publication, which uh, we hope will happen uh, next year. Uh, this uh, conference is really a sort of precursor of, uh, of, the, of the exhibition and uh, the publication. And it tries to uh, address or deal with a period that is very uh, little known, probably in the West, because uh, since the 1970s, we are very familiar with uh, the development of modern architecture in Japan. But prior to the 1970s, uh, especially the moment when you have the, the, the classic Japanese architecture and the introduction of uh, modernism to Japan and how that really evolves is something that maybe we are less familiar uh, with that particular period and, I, and uh, we very much hope to develop this through uh, the, the exhibition and the publication. As I said, today we will hear uh, certain, um, certain aspects of, uh, of this period. It is uh, clearly uh, significant that during the late 60s and 70s there was also uh, a great deal of collaboration between uh, British architects and uh, Japanese uh, architects, specifically uh, between the Metabolist Group and, uh, and Archigram. And uh, it's my uh, great pleasure that uh, uh, Professor Arata Izosaki is here and, uh, and, and Peter Cook and uh, we uh, are um, um, we are going to have the presentation by uh, Professor Izosaki with response by, by Peter, which would be uh, very interesting. And I, of course, uh, the, the fact that uh, Professor Suzuki um, is, uh, is here. This, uh, this uh, um, symposium has been made uh, possible uh, also because of the involvement of, uh, of Cairns with the Sainsbury Institute uh, for, the for the study of Japanese art and, and culture. And, uh, it is really their initiative and their involvement with uh, Nicole Romanier, who unfortunately can't be here, but Simon Kainer will, uh, will uh, speak to us on behalf of the Sainsbury Institute, and the Japan Foundation, who have been the other uh, sponsors of uh, this, uh, this event. So I'm personally looking forward to, uh, to, to this event uh, this afternoon, and uh, would like you to uh, welcome Simon, who will say a few words about the Sainsbury Institute before we have the presentations of the speakers. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Moisen, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, on behalf of all of us at the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, um, in particular, Dr. Nicole Rumanier, our director, who unfortunately can't be here um, this afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank Moisen and the Architectural Association um, and the Japan Foundation for their assistance in putting this um, very exciting program um, together. And um, on behalf of all of us, to extend a, a very warm welcome to all of our speakers who have come such a long way to uh, tell us about uh, modernism, Japanese architecture, and also to um, such a large audience who have turned up to hear us today. Um, Moisen asked if I could just say a couple of words about the Sainsbury Institute itself to give you an idea of why we are so interested in this theme. Um, say the Sainsbury Institute, or SISJAC it is, as it's sometimes known, was established in 1999 um, through the generosity of Sir Robert and Lady Sainsbury. Um, 
and we have our headquarters in the fine city of Norwich, in the Cathedral Close. Um, but we work very closely with the, our colleagues in the University of East Anglia and also our colleagues at SOAS um, here at the University of London. Um, the Sainsbury's have a long-standing um, relationship with Norwich and um, the, but starting out with their bequest in 1978 and the establishment of the Sainsbury Centre for Visual Arts, which now houses the Sainsbury Collection, a, a very fine collection of, um, of art and antiquities. Um, and that collection is housed in, um, in a building which some of you may be familiar with, which was designed by an architect who some of you may have heard of, Norman Foster. Um, and it was indeed his first public commission, um, that building, um, and it celebrated its 25th anniversary um, last year. Uh, when we discussed the program today with Lady Sainsbury herself, she, was, uh, she felt she was very, very excited about it, and um, she feels that it's entirely appropriate that Sainsbury Institute should be working in architecture and architectural history, um, given the um, innovative building um, in Norwich and our very own um, institute headquarters in the Cathedral Close, um, also of architectural interest, although from a somewhat more distant period. Um, just before... Um, just before um, int introducing us, because I wanted to just say a word about um, the program and our mission. And the mission of the Institute is to promote um, high quality, innovative, collaborative research um, with um, scholars in Japan, in Europe, and in North America on all aspects of Japanese arts and cultures. Um, I myself am a prehistoric archaeologist, and maybe it's strange that I should be introducing. Um, architects here this evening, although I have noted that Professor Isozaki has written extensively on ruins himself, and so maybe it's not quite so um, <coughs> out of place. Um, part of what we do is run a fellowship program, and this year we have five um, postdoctoral research fellows with us, um, based both in London and Norwich. And um, one of our fellows is um, Dr. Ken Tadashi Oshima, who um, has organised this evening's event. Um, Dr. Oshima is the first architectural historian that we've had as one of our research fellows, and he's spending a year um, in London as a Hander fellow, and indeed so impressed have we been with him um, that he's going to spend another year here um, as a Robert and Lisa Sainsbury fellow um, starting in the autumn. And that will help him hopefully work with the Architectural Association and foster the links that we will that we've very greatly value and have allowed us to pull this um, occasion together. Um, Ken's main research interests this year um, are focusing on 19th century British-Japanese relations um, in the field of design, um, especially through the work of Christopher Dresser. And um, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Ken, who's going to introduce us to the speakers and to this evening's programme. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Simon, and uh, thank you, Moisen. Um, I uh, would really like to extend my gratitude to the Architectural Association, to the Sainsbury Institute, and the Japan Foundation for really now enabling us to think about this topic of um, reflections on Japanese modernism, um, as the postcard says here. But um, as uh, Moisen mentioned, um, tonight's talks focus on Japanese modernism before the 1970s which is a vital link between the, quote, classic and contemporary Japanese architecture, although it's probably not as familiar to many of the students here um, today. Beyond following a simple linear development within Japan, Japanese modernism developed through extensive interchange with the work of architects around the world, as I think Simon mentioned and um, Moisen has um, also emphasized, um, especially from Britain. Japanese and British architectural cultures have in fact been inextricably interlinked, beginning with the British architect Josiah Condor, um, who arrived in Japan in 1877, and continuing through the 1960s and 70s in a dialogue between the Japanese Metabolist Group and the British Archogram Group. My own talk focuses on changing views of Japanese modernism from a Euro-American perspective to both situate the overall symposium and complement Professor Suzuki's talk that will trace a historical trajectory from a Japanese perspective. Tonight, I will highlight a few of the most notable viewpoints of Western architects and critics over more than a century to begin to critically assess the diversity of how Japanese modernism has 
and can be understood. Today, many architects from Japan are arguably global architects, from Jun Aoki designing numerous Louis Vuitton stores to Yoshio Taniguchi designing the new Museum of Modern Art in New York, slated to open in November. In our immediate context, the current issue of AA Files features the work of Shigeru Ban and Toyo Ito, who you might have heard speak here at the AA last autumn, or have experienced the 2002 Serpentine Pavilion that he designed with Cecil Baumond. Hence, certain modernist, um, or actually beyond the work of such superstar architects, the AA has featured, excuse me, um, has featured the complexities of the contemporary vernacular urban context in the 2001 publication, Do Android Crows Fly Over the Skies of an Electronic Tokyo? Here, journalist Akira Suzuki situated contemporary structures, including designs by Ito and Kazuo Sejima, within the constantly changing culture of mobile phones and convenience stores. Hence, certain modernist designs seen in isolation might reinforce a stereotypical image of Japanese architecture as simple and uniform, as we see here in Sejima's recent Dior building in the Omotesando district of Tokyo, or Waro Kishi's Nipponbashi house in Osaka from 1992. However, Sejima's apparent simplicity is the result of highly complicated material and structural systems, and Kishi's pencil building house must be seen within the complexity and chaos of its urban environment. However, if we look at the Japanese built environment through the perspective of time, through many decades, we see an even more complex evolution of form and cultural attitudes. In other words, it is hard to see a single essential image of Japan over time, but rather one sees a far more diverse picture emerge. Indeed, if we define modern architecture as forms current to their time, rather than as a narrowly defined style, we shall see a great variety of forms. Moreover, while architects through the last century have found resonance in Japanese architecture, they have each found inspiration in very different aspects. Charles Moore likened Japan to be a mirror or even the dark waters in which Narcissus saw himself. As he noted, when each Western visitor looks at Japan, he sees something of himself, or rather, himself as he would like to be. For the 19th century Victorian designer Christopher Dresser, the paradigm of Japanese design was to be found in its ornament, which was the topic of a lecture he gave right here at the Architectural Association in May of 1863. While Britain's first consul general to Japan, Rutherford Alcock, noted that the Japanese have no architecture, Dresser counted this notion by describing the powerful geometric order in these lattice patterns that went on display here at the AA in 1878. While Dresser was one of the first designers to visit Japan in 1876, since it officially opened to the West and write the book Japan, Its Architecture, Art, and Art Manufacturers, his depiction clearly expressed his temperament as an ornamental designer, finding Nikko to be, quote, the most beautiful of all the shrines of Japan, shrines as glorious in color as the Alhambra in the days of its splendor, and yet with a thousand times the interest of that of the beautiful building. Here the highly polychrome structure, ornamented with carved birds, flowers, water, clouds, was the paradigm of Dresser's Victorian ideals. Following Dresser's enthusiasm for stylized ornamental architecture and design in Japan, Frank Lloyd Wright found his own inspiration in both Japanese woodblock prints and a replica of the hand period Byodo-in in the 1893 Columbian Exposition at Chicago that led to his own journey to Japan in 1905. <coughs> During this trip, Wright took particular interest in the horizontal roofs of shrine structures, such as Ikuta Shrine in Kobe, as depicted here on the left, it, which is here from his um, own photo album. His subsequent 1910 design at the Roby House in Chicago indeed expressed this interest as he interpreted the horizontal roofs to accentuate the flatness of the prairie of the American Midwest. In the eyes of the West, beyond seeing the modernity of traditional structures in Japan, one of the most legendary early modern buildings in Japan was Frank Lloyd Wright's Imperial Hotel. Here, critics in the 1920s did not necessarily recognize its modernity through its reinterpretation of Japanese ornament in the, uh, in the form of the Japanese Oya stone, but rather for its highly publicized survival of the great Tokyo earthquake 
on its opening day, September 1, 1923, through the use of a floating pier structural system. However, more overtly modernist forms could be seen as early as 1925 in the Czech-born American architect Antony Raymond's own house. Raymond had come to Japan to work on the Imperial Hotel, but stayed on to establish his own practice. As Kenneth Frampton has noted, quote, Japan, susceptible to Western influence for over 50 years, was well prepared for the assimilation of the international style, whose arrival may be dated to the realization of Antony Raymond's first reinforced concrete house, built in Tokyo for his own occupation. Beyond Raymond's house, Japan was actually represented in the Museum of Modern Art's 1932 International Style exhibition and subsequent book by Mamoru Yamada's 19, 1930 Electrotechnical Laboratory. While curators Philip Johnson and H.R. Hitchcock included the work to include the global spread of the formal principles of the international style, they criticized its rounded edges, which they noted blur the effect of volume. However, this was a different modernist architecture. Yamada had, in fact, consciously sought after such rounded edges in the design as a central member of the Buniha Japanese secessionist movement to establish a modern creative architectural profession that rejected Western historicism and rigid structural determinism. While Japanese architectural historians typically identify the start of the modern movement in Japan to the founding of the Buniha in 1920, Formerly, their aesthetics had strong resonance with German expressionism, as seen in Yamada's design for the Tokyo Central Telegraph Office is the curved entrance canopy that we see here on the left. Beyond the narrow stylistic confines, such modern reinforced concrete structures were built both to respond to the seismic concerns exacerbated by the 1923 earthquake and programmatic requirements of new forms of communication equipment or for the hygienic requirements of hospitals such as the Teishin Hospital on the right, from 1937, also by Yamada. On a smaller scale, modernist dwellings such as Temi Horiguchi's Kikawa House from 1930, seen here on the left, could be interpreted to express tenets of European modernism, but also evolve from the tradition of post and beam traditional dwellings with tatami interiors. However, such Japanese tatami interiors were often published upside down in European journals. As we see in 1934 and the 1935 issue of L'Architecture Ose Dewey, um, if you can look at this carefully, you'll notice this apparent ceiling pattern are tatami mats. And these shoji screens would not be able to be exited from because of this low wall, both here and here. This actually happened continuously in the 30s and continues up until today, actually. <laughs> Well, many architects, both foreign and Japanese, argued that the tatami room spaces were inherently modern in its modularity and flexibility. The medium of photography itself could capture new views of more traditional elements through careful composition and cropping. These images, in their geometric abstraction and composition, could simultaneously recall elements of the Katsura Imperial Villa, as we see here in one of the pavilions. Um, or also of de Stiel, seen in the center image on the bottom of Theo van Dorsberg's counter composition from 1924. Thus, conflicting images of modern architecture in Japan as either continuing the tradition of post and beam tatami room interiors or geometric compositions constructed of modern industrial materials could be seen to merge in this image of Stemi Horiguchi's Okada House Garden from 1933. And as you might note, it is an image from the postcard that um, advertised this event. This image, taken by the pioneering architectural photographer Yoshio Watanabe, is what architectural historians have argued to be the starting point of modern architecture in Japan. It is at once an abstract, almost de Stiel composition of lines and planes composed in space, but also vividly records the design's materiality ranging from woven straw tatami mat to the rough volcanic stepping stone, to the smooth reflective surface of water. The house itself was resonant with the ideals of the Bauhaus, but also of Katsura Imperial Villa. While Horiguchi personally rediscovered Katsura as a paradigm for his design in the 1920s, German architect Bruno Taut brought it to the world stage by placing it on the same level of the Parthenon 
in his 1934 book, Nippon. The completion of the house in 1933, of the Okada house, in fact coincided with the arrival of Taut in May of that year. The beautiful time in late spring was precisely when he visited Katsura Villa. In direct contradiction to Christopher Dresser, Taut asserted, quote, Japan's architectural arts could not rise higher than Katsura, nor sink lower than Nikko, for Nikko was undigested importation, but Katsura was the intellectual assimilation of, um, was an intellectual assimilation of existing influences. Contemporary Japan therefore has a clear choice between the two poles which have been created in its own history. And as we see here, kata is modern quality, while niko is modern kitsch. Considering Tao's previous designs, such as the brightly colored housing facades in the Garden City of Falkenberg from 1914, and 1923 scheme for a new house, as we see here on the right, it is perhaps not surprising that he found tremendous inspiration in the polychrome designs of Katsura, seen here in the upper right in its vivid blue and white checkerboard pattern with gold leaf um, patinaed walls um, in harmony with the verdant landscape that, if you can imagine, would be beyond that um, image. Further, Tout's own design of the Hyuga Villa on the bottom right, built um, in the seaside village of Atami expresses both his artistic palette and enthusiasm for Katsura. Now, in contrast to Taut, the late influential Italian architectural historian Manfredo Tafuri became engrossed in modern post-World War II Japanese architecture based on themes which dominated architectural discourse in the 1960s, namely the design process and its methodology, the city as the context which provides architecture with its meaning, and architectural language as a means of symbolic communication. For Tafuri, Japan was a positive answer to the crisis of the modern movement because of the vigor with which it asserts its civic ideals and social contents at every level of the planning process. In particular, Tafuri became captivated, captivated in the dynamism and incontrovertible international influence of Kenzo Tange. Tafuri noted that Tange's 1960 megastructure plan for Tokyo summed up an entirely uncommon scale of design. While the Archigram was, group was also proposing utopian megastructure schemes in England, what made Tange's work particularly powerful for Tafuri was the fact that, unlike the British schemes, Tange's plans were actually being realized. For example, the Hiroshima Peace Memorial in Plaza in 1952, seen here on the left, and the Tokyo City Hall from the 1955 generation, and was in the process of completing the megastructure schemes of the Yamanashi Communication Center that we can see has a strong resonance with Michael Webb's design for a furniture factory that we see here on the left. For historian and critic Rainer Bannon, more than the work of Tange or Katsura, Kunio Maekawa's 1956 Harumi apartment block was especially powerful for its, quote, totally unexpected synthesis of Eastern and Western themes full of profound suggestions that seem to promise more for the West than for Japan. He argued that, quote, it is no longer traditional Japanese construction and craftsmanship, seen most conspicuously in the paradigm of Katsura, exercising a marginal influence on Western architecture, but a modern Japanese version of Western architecture which will exercise a central, not marginal, influence on the world at large. As Bannum continued, there now emerged a generation of Western architects who accepted their Japanese contemporaries as equals and sorely needed colleagues in the battle with the supposed follies of their elders. Indeed, the A has hosted lectures from over the past three decades by dozens of architects from Japan, including Fumihiko Maki, Hiroshi Hara, Kazuo Shinohara, Shin Takamatsu, Tado Ando, Kisho uh, Kurokawa, and Toyoito four times, in fact. A fascination with Japanese art and architecture has continued to inspire architects through our more recent past, as we see here in the AA events listings from January 1980, with Katsura featured on the left as a prime example of Japanese timber architecture, and ukiyo-e as part of a Japan-style season. These events, in fact, coincided with a lecture by Arata Isazaki, 
who at the time was a visiting critic for a diploma unit to conduct a week-long project for A House for a Superstar at Brighton, based on the 1975 Shinkenshiku house design competition set by Isazaki. The first prize winner of Isazaki Shinkenshiku competition was the former longtime A unit master Tom Hennigan, who proposed a house for Raquel Welch. In fact, since the 1970s, journalists such as, journals such as the Japan Architect have sponsored such international competitions that have served as an international forum for the development of new architectural thinking, with entrants including Peter Nelson Smithson and judges including Peter Cook. For Tom Hennigan, his competition entry pr proved to foreshadow his professional career as he eventually moved to Japan in 1990, where he practiced for 12 years before becoming the chair of architecture at the University of Sydney. More recently, we can see, most notably, such a symbiotic connection between Japan and Britain in the 1995 Yokohama Port Terminal Competition. As we see here in the AA events listing, AA Associates dominate awards list for Yokohama International Port Terminal Competition, in which um, Isazaki, incidentally, was again a judge. As many of you know, former AA unit masters um, foreign office architects won first prize and again realized their ambitious scheme through a rigorous seven-year period. Actually. Examining the changing views of Japanese modernism over the course of a century and a half, we thus see the vivid contrast of Alcock asserting that Japan has no architecture to be the prime site of architecture's realization. Far from a one-way discourse, the impact of this interchange has informed design in both England and Japan. These examples of Dresser, Wright, Tout, and Tofuri, among others, indeed illustrate as much about these individuals and their times as much as they reveal about Japan. Within this period, architecture in Japan has been practiced or has been praised both for its ornamental and minimal character and both tranquil and chaotic order. Of course, architecture in Japan has constantly transformed, exacerbated by the destruction of the 1923 earthquake, World War II, and more recently by land developers. But again, the multiplicity of forms has emerged through a dynamic interchange that is both global and local and oscillates in a dialogue between imagined and built work. It emphasized the importance of ideas cultivated in a world context that might be built locally. In a symbolic, or in symbiotic process connected through time and space, but constantly evolving through changing perceptions. To return to Charles Moore's metaphor, the mirror reflects, but it also transforms the image in the process. While of course it's impossible to comprehensively cover the entire history of Japanese modernism in three hours, the following talks will provide a broad cross-section of this period from both historical and personal <laughs> assessment Tonight, we are privileged to have Hiroyuki Suzuki, Professor of Architectural History at Tokyo University, who will speak on seven generations of Japanese architects. Professor Suzuki is especially well-versed to speak on tonight's topic in relationship to Britain, as he has also been a researcher at the Courtauld Institute of Art here in London, and also the author of Contemporary Architecture of Japan, 1958 to 1984, that he wrote with Rainer Bannum. We also have a European perspective from Hira van Sande, who is a professor of architecture both in Ghent and Brussels. Hira, having collaborated with Toyo Ito as the project architect for the construction of the Bruges 2002 pavilion, will bring her insight both as an architect and historian on the 1958 Japan pavilion in Brussels by Kunio Maikawa. We are also privileged to have Arata Isazaki with us today, who is a direct witness of this period and we'll talk about the formative period of his career in the 1960s, highlighted by such remarkable projects such as Cities in the Air from 1961 and the exposed reinforced concrete Oita Prefectural Library from 1966. Peter Cook, who many of you know through his recent Kunsthalle in Graz designed with Colin Fournier, is a longtime friend of Isazaki since they first met at the 1968 Milan Triennale, and soon after spent three months teaching together at UCLA. In fact, Peter Cook has wrote in an essay on Isazaki that the city in the air was the first Japanese project that inspired him, and that Japan, England, and Austria are the three places where architecture is still in a state of theoretical metamorphosis. Hopefully, through tonight's symposium, this international discourse will continue. Thank you.
So next we'll have Professor Suzuki. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure and honor to be here and talk something about Japanese architecture. Uh, Ken suggested me to talk uh, something behind the scene or background of Japanese modernists. So I may uh, talk a little bit earlier uh, phase of Japanese architecture. In the modernization history of Asian countries can be regarded as a history of researching for expression between intrinsicality and universality. The formal contact between Japanese and Western architecture occurred right after Japan opened the country to the West in 1854. The prevalent Western architectural style then was <coughs> historical revivalism. And since Japan learned directly from Britain, it accepted the Victorian Gothic. In the process of Japanese modernization, there were several generations or trends among the architects connected with the originality of Japanese architecture. We can distinguish seven major generations, trends, or schools. The first generation is uh, the <coughs> traditional carpenters adopted themselves to the Western architecture that might be called Westernesque or Sudwestern. The first generation was composed of architects who created <coughs> Westernesque or Sudwestern architecture. Many of them were carpenters from the Edo period who mastered <coughs> the indigenous skills of traditional Japanese building techniques and used the skill to build Sudwestern style, <coughs> Western style architectural forms. Uh, <coughs> essential techniques of them was to create Western atmosphere in building, accumulating traditional and Western architectural motifs. Shimizu Kisuke the second is the one of the representative of such kind of uh, carpenters. And Actually, he created uh, the super general contractors, still now <coughs> prosperous. Other one is the uh, Tateishi Kiyoshige. He built this uh, school in the local village of Japan. And in this building, you can see many oh, sorry, uh, <coughs> motifs here and there. The second generation is a revivalism. It was made by foreign architects worked for the Japanese government. Soon after Meiji Restoration in 1868, Japanese government set up the Institution for Higher Education of Engineering. It became <coughs> the Imperial College of Engineering, ICE, in Japanese, Kobu Daigakko. Many capable men of talent were invited to the I ICE from Glasgow. They introduced the basic engineering techniques to Japan and provided the foundation for the country's future development. However, it was difficult to get good architects from Glasgow then. They invited young architect from London. He is Josiah Konda, the first professor of architecture at I the ICE. Beside him 
Japanese government invited many engineers to design railways, facilities, lighthouses, bridges, tunnels, and harbors, etc. Their works were rather conservative and in the style of revivalism. In such style, they created new landscape of Japan and influenced many Japanese. The, in, ca in the case of uh, Josiah Konda, he regarded uh, such kind of Islamic style is most <coughs> suitable for Japan because Japan is not Western, some kind of Oriental countries. So <coughs> Islamic <laughs> motif is very suitable, at least for him. And he designed uh, such kind of office building here and such kind of um, residence for the new riches in Japan. Oh, sorry. The third generation is ICE boys. The first generation of Japanese architects studied Western architecture. Through the classes, the imperial college of engineering gave lessons how to design Western style architecture and not to teach how to improve traditional Japanese architecture. The national aim then was to build Japanese cities like those in the Western countries. One of the first graduates from the ICE, Tatsuno Kingo, studied in London under <coughs> William Burgess and introduced Victorian architecture to Japan. Other graduate of ICE, Katayama Tokuma, designed a palace for Crown Prince in the neo-baroque style. They tried to realize dreams of Meiji government. This is the um, Tatsuno's design, head office <coughs> of Bank of Japan, in, in what kind of style <laughs> you can <laughs> understand. And he also designed uh, the Tokyo Central Station. This is strongly influenced by the Victorian Gothic and uh, Scotland Yard. And his classmate, Katayama Tokuma designed this neo-baroque style of Crown Prince Paris. Then <coughs> the fourth generation mm, appears. This generation mm, shows the modern traditional. After the decades from the opening country, sorry, After the decades from the opening country to the West, Japanese capitalists and indus industrialists accumulated a considerable amount of capital under strong leadership and careful protection of the government. New leaders were enthusiastic for building Western-style cities and buildings, but they wanted traditional style of residences for their private life. They could be regarded as a manifested those buildings could be regarded as a manifestation of indigene indigenous spirit of national identity in the age of westernization. Tea house masters, tea house master carpenters and tea masters since Edo period won the favor of new capitalists and high officials. officials. Their works were produce products of the other aspect of modernization process of Japan. This was the re main residence of the um, Shibusawa Eiji. He is called the father of capitalism in Japan and was designed by Kashiwagi Kaichiro in the traditional style. But this is not a traditional residence. It, uh, typical expression of Japanese modernity. And this, these tea houses were designed by Omirodo, another tea master. He was the, the favorite tea, tea house designers among Japanese capitalists. Japanese capitalism found these, in these buildings their expression of richness and modernity too. Then the fifth generation appears. 
The second generation of Japanese architects who studied Western architecture at the Tokyo Imperial University, the former ICE, widened their professional field of activities towards social and business building in Western style and residences in traditional style. They can choose any style suitable for occasion. Among these generations, Takeda Goichi designed offices in Western style, houses in eclectic style. He became first professor of architectural design at Kyoto Imperial University. Tanabe Junkichi, who was the in-house designer at the Shimizu Co Construction Company, designed wood cottage, brick cottage, and reinforced concrete memorial building in different style, respectively, for Shibusawa Eiichi, the father of Japanese capitalism. And in case of Fuji Koji, who also became a professor of architectural design and theory at the Kyoto Imperial University, built his own houses five times to create modern house suitable for Japanese lifestyle in the early 20th century. Architects of this generation often pick Japanese elements up to their works because of their aesthetic refinement and versatility. This style has the power to adopt the modern life in the Western fashion. At the same time, they introduced recent Western elements such as arts and crafts motifs. Their way of design could be said as free traditional. This was designed by Takeda Goichi for um, Murai families, but the house is now transferred to Kyoto and became the temp one of the temple buildings. And here and the, here you can see the reference to the Katsura the Royal Palace, and here you can see many traditional motifs. But in other part, you can see very art and crafts like pattern design for sliding doors and some other parts. And he also designed this house for other um, wealthy family in Kyoto. And still in that house, people gathered in traditional way. But here you can see the decorative <coughs> element quite um, mo modern in that sense. And here you can see the quite eclectic of Western and Eastern element in the decorative fields. And on the floor, he put very complicated craftsmanship here to put the decorative pattern on the floor. And here you can see the very elaborate etching of decorative design. And in the garden of this re residence was designed by the gardener Ogawa Jihei. He also modernized the traditional Japanese garden. This might be seen as a typical traditional Japanese garden, but they have comparatively large room space here and there to, to be prepared for the garden party in the Western style. So, this is one of the modernized Japanese style garden. And Takeda Goichi also designed Chinese style building in Kyoto. In this case, the owner was a collector of the Chinese object. So he chose Chinese style and he did it quite authentically. And in case of Tanabe Junkichi, Uh, he designed this brick um, cottage for the Shibusawa Eiichi, the father of Japanese capitalism. Uh, <coughs> in this case, he put this dormer window without any function because uh, it is purely for the outside design. There is no room or no, um, no space underneath the part. And the building were very delicately designed with brickwork. And quite recently, this building was uh, removed to 
the Shibusawa's birth place. So they dismantled wooden part and cut the brick walls and moved all the building to about eight, 80 kilometers to his birth place and rebuilt them as it was. And here you can see the Kiju, this was mean the 77th birthday uh, memorial. This building was uh, <coughs> built for his 17th um, birthday. And at the same time, this small cottage was also built for the, the um, birthday gift for the Shibusawa Eiichi. In this case, this was also designed by Tanabe Junkichi. This was wooden buildings. And he put um, several arts and crafts motifs here and there. So he can use um, any kind of design according to the occasion. And several years later, he also designed for Shibusawa Eiichi this memorial library. In, <coughs> in the reinforced concrete and brick. And in this case also, mm, he put so many decorative elements free from mm, historical revivalism. And quite recently, this building also <coughs> was restored very carefully using uh, some part of the window were rotten because all these parts were made by steel. steel. So the rusted part or lost part were replaced by the stainless steel and carefully put together. So this is one of the most elaborate way of restoration in Japan. And in case of Fuji Koji, He built um, his own house near Kyoto for five times. And this is the last, oh, sorry, last one uh, called Chochikkyo. It's a cottage to listen to the bamboo. It's in the middle of the mountainside. And it has quite wide opening. And corner of the building were covered by grass. So it's quite modern and quite, in some sense, quite traditional, but in some sense quite modern. He tried to find the new way for the Japanese residents. And inside each room connected together with some kind of opening. And from inside, we can see the outside scenery and inside space and outside space mm, interacted together. Then the <coughs> Japanese modernist in the narrow sense appears. It is the sixth generation Bunriha, Japanese secessionist. As can referred before, these people declared that they are the, they are free from mm, revivalism, and they try to express themselves as a mm, Japanese avant-garde. In 1920s, Josiah Konda, the first professor of architecture in Japan, died in Tokyo. In the same year, six of the 16 graduates from the Department of Architecture of the Tokyo, Uni Tokyo Imperial University held a small-scale exhibition of, of their own works. And later, their works, essays, and manifestos were collected in the book Works of Secessionist Architect Architectural Associations. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. It is regarded as the beginning of the 
<coughs> earliest um, architectural movement of secessionist school and indicated a sign of Japanese architectural avant-garde movement. They had two aspects. One was to opposed to the academic tradition, which was then dominated by the structural engineers. Another was the introduction of latest European architectural trends. Japanese avant-garde always had a face of importer of the latest fashion into Japan. One of the members of the movement, Horiguchi Stemi, later became researcher of old tea master Senrikyu, and traditional tea houses. Other member, Morita Keiichi, became professor of architectural history at the Kyoto Imperial University and translated Vitruvius's uh, 10 books of architecture into Japanese. So he became classicist. Another member, Yamada Mamoru, uh, concerning him, <laughs> Ken um, introduced many his um, works. <coughs> later designed Kyoto Tower and Japanese traditional sports hall, both in traditional style. They all turned themselves into traditional spheres. This is uh, Horing Jistemi's uh, one earlier work, uh, Koide Residence. And in this case, the interior can be said uh, either Western or Eastern. And this is the entrance. And here you can see inside of the entrance hall. You can recognize uh, such strange pattern of tiles. Because in Japanese house, we have to put off shoes. And in this case, door will open inside. So beyond these colors of tiles, if you put shoes, the door will sweep your shoes to the walls. <laughs> so it's very <laughs> nice design. <laughs> so uh, always uh, Horing uh, thinks how to design Western style building in Japan. This is one of his solutions. And this is the Okada residence. He, uh, this was also referred by Ken. In this case, the <coughs> Left hand side is in traditional style, and right hand side is in Western style. This house was wooden house, and this part was concrete house. He put them together, and the garden itself is divided into two styles, Japanese and Western. And these are all traditional mm -hmm. part of the house. And this is the western part of the house. Through the western room, you can see the traditional part of this house. This is another mm, answer of him for Japanese <coughs> western building. This is the traditional part of the interior. And this is a connecting part. And these are the western rooms on the right hand side. But later he concentrated himself to the study of traditional tea houses and this is one of his latest work to move the National Treasures Tea House Joan to Inuyama, it's near Nagoya. Uh, he became the researcher and scholar of tea ceremony and tea houses. And in case of Yamada Mamoru, later he designed this tower in just in front of the Kyoto station in traditional feeling. And this is the um, hall for traditional martial arts in Tokyo. This, was, um, this has very big traditional roof. So he changed his design for the traditional expression. Then the seventh generation, the last generation in this talk arrives. The, it was the post-war modernism. After the World War II, many Japanese architects started to produce prolific works 
in the Western modern style. Nevertheless, in most of the architectural works of the 1950s, the pre-war aesthetic ideology was survived. Works continued to appear based on concrete <coughs> structure. Most of the aesthetic came from Japanese architecture and houses. Maika Kunio casually employed the details in composition of Japanese noble houses and chambers, added them to <coughs> Corbusian forms, initiating the post-war concrete architecture. Whereas, in contrast, Tange Kenzo produced the religious structure of Japanese shrine and temples. The planning for Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park was based on the very image of the local Itsukushima Shrine, his Kanaga Kanawa prefectural governmental office, office design took the form of five-story pagoda and Buddhist Amidaba hall to reappear in the pram with the form of a four-faced temple hall. Younger generations after Tange also were inspired by historic composition in several projects. It was, however, Tang Kenzo who made the initial attempt. This is the um, Hiroshima Peace Center and the plan of the Hiroshima Peace Center. But it's, the composition is quite similar for the Itsukushima Shrine, quite near from this um, Peace Center. This is a plan of the Itsukushima Shrine. And of course, this is typical um, modernism architecture. But the structure is quite similar to the Itsukushima Shrine if we put off all these roofs. And uh, this is a piloti in the Corbusian way. But uh, such kind of space with pillars are quite familiar in Itsukushima Shrine. And in the side building, he directly copied the pattern of stepping stone underneath the piloti. And in the case of central, P, central building, he put similar pattern on the staircase underneath the piloti. And in the center, he put the memorial on the canal just like the Itsukushima Shrine, which was built on the um, sea coast. And through the piloti, we can see the, this memorial here. And through this memorial, we can see the ruined dome. It's a symbol of atomic bomb. This composition is just like uh, Itsukushima Shrine. In this case, we can see the shrine gate on the sea, and through this, through this gate, the axis approaches to this way and go to the main building of the shrine in this direction. And you can see the main axis and composition of the Itsukushima Shrine. Through the gate, uh, they approached the shrine and landed here and see the shrine and pay was it. And through the gate, you can see the shrine and the holy mountain behind. In case of Hiroshima Peace Center, through the memorial, we can see this ruined dome. So uh, this is typical modern architecture in Japan after the war, but the many concepts came from the traditional <coughs> Japanese architectural composition. So it is not so simple to find how Japanese modernism came from. And of course, Tokyo is in chaotic condition now, <laughs> but we should find many roots and many stories from this chaos. Thank you for your attention.
<coughs> Good afternoon. After this overview of uh, seven generations of architects, I will more zoom in on uh, actually one building of one architect. Um, as Professor Suzuki mentioned, Kurt Maikawa is one of the seven, seventh generation architects. So <laughs> I kind of uh, continue, but then more uh, on one project. Um, for Japan, the pavilion on Expo 58, uh, uh, this is maybe also important to mention, uh, Maikawa was uh, uh, an architect who, has, oops, who worked in the Corbusier's office between uh, 28 and 30. So his work is clearly influenced by uh, Corbusier. For Japan, the pavilion on Expo 58 had a special meaning. After the, after the traumatic experience of the World War, Contributing to the first post-war fair represented a full comeback into the international scene for Japan. The Japanese authorities were fully aware of this. The Japanese pavilion was of a striking serenity. The pages of history were turned over and the future lay ahead. This attitude was embodied by the Japanese pavilion and its architect Maikawa. When in 1956, a Jetro, the Japan External Trade and Recovering Organization, was looking for an architect uh, to design the pavilion, a thorough screening of the Japanese architectural scene was done. Finally, three important modernist architects remained, Kunio Maikawa, Junzu Sakakura, and Kenzo Tange. The choice of three modernist architects clearly stressed the wish of the authorities to give the pavilion a Western profile. Maikawa and Sakakura had both worked at Le Corbusier's office. As I said, Maikawa from 1928 to 1930, and Sakakura, uh, consequently, from 1930 to 1936. Tange uh, has debuted in the office of Maikawa and strongly advocated also Corbusier's ideas. Maikawa and Sakakura already confronted each other in the past over Japanese pavilion. In the competition for the Paris World Fair in 1937, Maikawa had won the competition, but it didn't get built. Sakakura, who hadn't even participated in the competition, was asked to build it. Maikawa had designed the building. This is the proposal by Maikawa, uh, the competition entry. He had designed the building in a resolute modernist idiom, clearly marked by the work of Le Corbusier in those years. Uh, it clearly referred to his own graduation project in 1928 in the uh, bottom right in Tokyo Imperial University, <coughs> where he got submerged in Corbusier's, Corbusier's ideas um, through some books he got uh, as a gift from his professor. Immediately after graduation, he left for Paris to enter Corbusier's office. Um, he did not only submerge in Le Corbusier's designs and ideas, but also in the European culture at that time. He wrote, I arrived at the Gare du Nord in Paris 10 years after the armistice. France seemed to be enjoying the post-war prosperity, but with some anxiety about the destiny of Western civilization. Maikawa believed that the optimism of modern civilization had been destroyed by the two world wars. And he continues, today it must be the task of the architect to assemble the broken pieces of brick and rebuild the human environment from no other motivation than real human need. This quote is crucial to understand Maikawa's work and his pavilion on Expo 58. For Maikawa, Modern architecture is architecture for the people. Here, in this proposal, uh, the, the pavilion of 1937 was assembled by fragments loosely put together. The most striking element was a panoramic uh, room with a view onto Paris. The scene, the, the Seine, the Eiffel Tower, the Trocadero, as Maikawa uh, writes on the sketch in the bottom left, uh, was important uh, for him to frame in this uh, room. This view was combined with the composition above, evoking a Japanese identity with the Fuji mountain and some contemporary products of um, Japanese industry, as if to show the obviousness of Japan with its traditions belonging to the contemporary world, East and West as complementary, uh, facing its contradictions. The blunt modernist expression of his proposal gave, race, gave rise to a debate 
about the design not being Japanese enough. This combined with the economical hardship in Japan at that time and the fact that Sakakura was living in Paris, the commission was given to Sakakura. Um, this pavilion turned out to be one of the most remarkable buildings on the <coughs> Paris Fair and meant, as Tafuri formulated it, the official entree of the Japanese architectural culture in the international debate. Tafuri called it one of the best succeeded expressions of synthesis between two traditionally contradicted cultures. <coughs> Maikawa was deeply disappointed about the rejection of his design. In 1935, at the age of 30, he had started his own practice. This project could have meant a major set-off. From the 12 competition designs Maikawa entered between 1930 and 1945, eight took first prize, two second prize, and one third prize. None of them, however, got realized. Later, Maikawa admitted that Sakakura's design had embodied more his, his objectives than his own design. Sakakura's design showed a less direct and aggressive modernity and testified of more maturity, <coughs> with a less pol polemic attitude. The modern aspect in this pavilion was not in opposition to tradition, but was experienced as a natural continuation and expression of it. Nor Maikawa's nor Sakakura's design could be considered representative of the situation in Japan at that time. There was a circle of active, of young, modernist-inspired architects um, who were heard of in magazines, galleries, and competitions. But the entire architectural scene was dominated by the nationalistic-inspired architecture style, Taikan Yoshiki, as a modern Western construction decorated by a heavy Asian roof. As Professor Suzuki said, Japan didn't really have an architectural style. Even the word architecture didn't exist uh, until late 19th century. So in search of expressing a national identity in growing nationalistic times, Teika Nyushiki, as you see an example in the top right, was considered to be appropriate for both expressing progress and a distinct Japaneseness. So here you can see the winning entry at the top for the Tokyo Imperial Household Museum competition next to Maikawa's entry. And um, I put a, a, a picture of the Corbusier's architecture at that time, so you can see the, clearly the influence in Maikawa's design of Corbusier's work. The dilemma between tradition and modernity was rejected very early by Maikawa. He was both sympathetic and critical towards both. He was convinced of the fact that architecture had to go with its time and so be modern, but that this time could only exist as the fruits of a living tradition that could not be denied. Here you see another competition entry for the Nagoya City Hall, and also in the plan layout you can clearly feel um, an association with Corbusier's work the Centro Soyuz, on which he worked when he was in the office. <coughs> Here you can see the first building uh, by Maikawa, uh, the Kimura Manufacturing Laboratory in Hirosaki in 1934. And here you can clearly see that he is uh, submerged in the white purist ideas of Corbusier, as you see the Villa Stein de Monsi. I just uh, heard from Professor Suzuki that this building has been classified as a monument in Japan. Some kind of. Some kind <laughs> of monument. <laughs> so I'll just make a small <coughs> side jump now and I, I give an over, uh, a quick overview of Maikawa's work so you can kind of understand his, um, his, the, the, his approach to architecture. Uh, this building, the Kirokunya Bookstore in 1947, was the first um, building of importance after the World War in uh, 1947. So because of scarcity of materials, it was built in wood. And it, it was called, um, some architecture critic wrote, uh, calling it a phoenix rising from the ashes, a first start of post war modernist architecture. Soon after that, concrete made its entry and Maikawa fully exploited the material to transla translate the modernist uh, language. Here you have the Kanagawa Concert Hall and Library, which you can, cannot see, it's on the left, of 1952, 
here you see some other projects done by him at the Fukushima Education Hall on the um, top left, the Setagaya Community Center, the top right, and then uh, a, a later work in where he uses uh, concrete in a sculpture way uh, right next to the Kanagawa uh, Prefectural <coughs> Hall. This was also shown um, by Ken, the Harumi apartment block, um, which actually kind of refers to the Unité d'Habitation by Corbusier Marseille, in a sense that he reinterpreted the um, skip floor system. Uh, in, the, in the top is the Unité d'Habitation, where Corbusier has the central corridor uh, giving entrance to two apartments, uh, one top, one bottom. And Maikawa, he, he changed the, the idea of having also one uh, central corridor, but he put it as a broad street on the outside. Here. And then he, he gives way to, to uh, it's not, an, uh, not ap apartments who, go, who have um, a duplex uh, idea, but they go down to level three uh, for apartment three. Uh, apartment one is one level and apartment two goes up. So it's kind of reinterpretation of the idea of a Corbusier. Uh, this building is uh, in the late 50s. It's the Tokyo Festival Hall, uh, early 60s. Um, it's seen from, uh, Corbusier has built one building in Japan. It's the museum, the, the Western Museum, the Museum of Western Art. And it's seen from that building towards uh, Maikawa's building. And um, as you can see, uh, Maikawa clearly has been influenced in, during his entire career by the ideas of um, the Corbusier, although one cannot clearly say it's um, uh, the primary source of inspiration, one can also call the, this building a festival hall uh, ref as referring to the Japanese tradition, a bit with the big uh, roo roofs hanging, overhanging roofs and the piloti system. And then the, another project is the Kyoto Hall in 1961. Here, as you can see, how, how it's also kind of forming a translation of the traditional temple construction, translated into modern uh, architecture. Uh, I'm just showing this kind of to uh, situate uh, his work. Here you have a, a competition entry for the Hiroshima Cathedral, where you, you can see in the sketches that the right one is a sketch of Corbusier, and here this is a, a scan of the sketchbooks by uh, Maikawa. You, you can clearly see how he, he tries to find his own way, but uh, using some um, inspiration. And this is sketches from for his own house in 1971, where he um, draws back on the Pilastein. Actually, when he arrived in Paris in 1928, on the f day of his arrival, he was uh, taken by Corbusier to see the Pilastein, and this really left a major impression on him, which can be clearly seen. So it's, I, even his work is in close dialogue with Corbusier, I, I still think his, his, his work is very genuine and marking a shift within the Japanese architectural scene. Uh, how, different, how different all these designs may be, they all testify of the same approach and have a distinguish, distinguishable character. The symbiosis of tradition and modernity, of particularity and universal, universality. This, this symbiosis is perfect. At first sight, the Brussels Pavilion seems to mark a rupture in this homogeneity. Even the imposing Japanese pavilion on the World Fair of 96 in New York, also by the hand of Maikawa, seems to be more related to his own work. Why this distinct character? <coughs> the pavilion was a temporary building with, with as its main objective, the re representation of Japan. Until that time, Maikawa had been building within Japan, apart from an interwar period in Manchuria, and had been preoccupied with grounding his modernist ideals in a Japanese experience. He had tried to resolve the tension between a universalist impulse and a craving for authentic localism, never losing the social aim of making architecture for the people out of his sight. Participating on a world fair reversed the question, how to show Japan to your European public. For Maikawa, the autonomy of architecture lay in the specific way how it contributed to the social process. In this design, he spoke as a Japanese, who not only cared about his country, 
but also about the actual world and its entity. He didn't bring a message of Japan, but looked for values that could improve the contemporary world. In his essay, Thoughts on Civilization, Civilization uh, and Architecture in 1965, he explicitly, explicitly writes, we must go back to the beginnings of Western civilization and discover whether the power to bring about such ethical revolution can really be founded in the inventory of Western civilization itself. If not, we must seek it together with Toynbee in the Orient as perhaps in Japan. It is this quest, this quest that takes place within the Japanese pavilion in Brussels. Maikawa wants to avoid and overcome the seemingly dilemma between nationalism and modernism, to investigate the real problems of the modern world and particularly those of architecture. He always needed to defend himself on two fronts. For some, he wasn't modern enough. For others, he was not nationalistic enough. His independent position was even more delicate being Japanese, and because traditional Japanese architecture was absorbed by modernism as a kind of model. Therefore, in the Japanese uh, pavilion, it is not about which elements are modern and which elements are traditional, uh, a distinction that often happens. The roof uh, is then supposedly be modern, and the infill of the panels is supposedly to be traditional, kind of um, labeling the pavilion into two worlds. One has to see the pavilion as an entity, showing his conviction as a perfect balance in between these two worlds, making this pavilion central in his oeuvre. Maikawa's choice of the leading theme of the exhibition, <laughs> the Japanese hand and the machine, refer to the same fundamental attitude. And the general theme of Expo 58 was industrial culture and the problem of a new humanism. This was simply translated by Maikawa into machine versus hand, industrial culture for machine and problem of new humanism uh, as a hand. It was a genius idea. The theme of machine versus hand that had dominated the modern discussion was put into a timeless poetic context. Ruskin and Morris had used the hand as a symbol of humanity in their first fight against the machine. Le Corbusier had chosen the open hand, la main ouverte, in Chandigarh to express his belief in a new civilization. The hand was a splendid sign of human intelligence, both in Eastern and in Western tradition. With some imagination, the roof of the pavilion could be seen as two unfolded hands, thinking of the iconography of the hands of Buddha statues in Japan. For the concept of the building, Maikawa wanted to go back to an element stressing the steadiness and the distinctness of Japanese traditional culture. As he wrote in the previous statement about, about going back to the origins, he went back to the basics of Japanese culture, man in the world, man in nature. Nature has always been inseparably part of Japanese culture throughout a thousand years of history. The cultivating of the Japanese garden had been a continuous quest of man to find its pla his place in nature, a quest of man to find himself. The pavilion of Maikawa is in the first place a garden. A garden in which nature and man's work, work with the hand, but also work with the machine, is reaching a symbiosis. It is not, as in the Japanese pavilion of 1939 in New York, an exotic Japanese garden brought to its site. It is rather a gesture that uses its position in the Brussels Park as a starting point. The Belgian trees, as the Richards wrote, have become Japanese. It is a garden without boundaries, connecting to the existing landscape. It is not about the transformation, uh, but about a new relationship between man and nature, about a new fundamental unity between the diversity of cultures. Actually, the location of the pavilion in the domain of Expo 58 was maybe responsible for this concept. Unfortunately, on the outskirts, but luckily for Maikawa, at the border of the Belvedere of the Royal Palace, it was surrounded by green. The actual pavilion was, as a tea house, part of the garden. Maikawa mentioned it as un abri dans le jardin, a shelter in the garden. The pavilion was not a closed building. It was merely consisting out of a roof, giving room to a place to assemble 
to meditate, to shelter in open connection to its environment. The technically beautifully constructed roof in itself was not particularly ex exceptional. It didn't have a high-tech message, but was rather the poetic image of a floating butterfly, a light parasol, almost as a built haiku. It is a modest but confident construction of great refinement. Not one moment technique is taking control, but it grows out into an effortless, obvious shape. The, metal roof, the big metal roof is being supported on concrete legs in a reversed V-shape. Here the genius game starts. Uh, on the concrete legs, expressing their bearing functions as well as their independency, they're, su they're, they're supporting a, a metal girder, but not directly. As you can see, on top of the concrete um, beams, there is a small piece of metal indirectly supporting the, the metal girder. It's more clear on this. Metal joints are making the connection. From this girder, two wings of the roof are departing. They are getting more narrow towards its ending, uh, showing an inverse movement of these V columns. <coughs> At the end, the wings are being supported by light metal tubes connected by a steel cross. Those concrete V legs respond mostly to the expressiveness in Maikawa's oeuvre. You can see the construction drawing and a detail of the steel beams at the end. Um, the concrete legs are put onto a platform reached by sloping ramps. The far-reaching floating roof is expressing a feeling of horizontality, typical for Japanese architecture, traditional architecture, that finds its connection with nature. In the bottom sketch, the, you can see um, the essence of Japanese traditional architecture. It can literally be seen as being under a roof. A building consists of a raised floor and a roof where people gather. But where the traditional roof is coming down, keeping out the oppressing rays of sunlight, the two wings of the roof of the pavilion meet each other in the lowest point to reach upward towards infinity instead of grasping the protecting space, the protected space. The role of the roof as revelation of nature and its infinity is stressed by the opening in the roof, by opening in the roof, giving space to a patio in the pavilion. The lightness of the roof is seen by the visible steel girders. Under the roof, the garden is continuing. In the patio, but also here you can see stones and grass in the patio, but also in other spaces within the pavilion, as you can see here at the bottom right, the grass and the rocks and the pebbles are continuing inside of the interior. The roof is merely a shadow spot within the garden, leaving everything as open as possible. Even the more traditional, traditionally closed functions as utility buildings and restaurants of the pavilion are simply put under the roof. Mm, I have to show it in another slide. The contrast between the open pavilion and the closed side buildings here, on the left side, you see the closed service building with just neatly uh, shifts underneath the roof. The contrast between the open pavilion and the closed side buildings is adding to the non-conformist directness of this architecture. In this approach, one can no longer speak of facades. There was no true front to this building. Ah, here. There was no true front to this building. Uh, just a wall equal to all other divisions in the pavilion onto which the name Japan was marked could maybe be considered as a front leading towards the entrance. Making a fixed infill of the space under the roof has something ambivalent. In a subtle way, Maikawa resolved this by raising the walls, by structuring them and dividing them into transparent and non-transparent panels. They lose their closed feeling. The white full panels never touch roof nor floor. They belong to one continuous glass wall reaching from bottom to top. The glass bottom part didn't even have frames, but directly stood on the ground to let nature freely flow in. 
you, you can see no frames. Everything is covered by glass at the bottom part. The division of this wall in dark uh, wooden structure with white panel infills most strongly of all recalls associations with the traditional Japanese architecture. It could have been a copy of the Katsura Villa. In the pavilion, the walls have a temporary movable character. They never close into a figure, but interact, overlap, pass each other. They have a double function. They protect the outside environment, but they also are carrier of the pictures of the exhibition. They guide the visitor through the pavilion, through the exhibition, in one continuous walk. Openings in the walls with glass panels give view towards the garden and reinforce their interconnection. As you can see in the model, some of the panels are not in white, but in glass. The exhibition space is strengthened by the presence of nature, of light, of the rhythm of walls, here of the movement of floors, giving atmosphere and identity within the pavilion. <coughs> Maikawa has designed the fixed and movable furniture with traditional materials in a modern way. The pillows are imprinted with crests of traditional Japanese families, and the colors he used belong to the traditional colors of Kabuki theater, black, purple, gold, red, green. Even the inlay of some pan the panels, in the, uh, the panels he used, some of them are even treated with the same colors. Here at the entrance you have the red, and, and uh, when you go in, two golden panels. The leaflet that was handed out to the visitors also reinterpreted traditional panels and colors in a mo modern way. The exhibition was literally integrated within the building. They actually revealed the space and made it concrete. I will not go into detail into the exhibition layout nor the choice of the artifacts because this would lead us too far. I could just maybe mention how the image of the hand as a thread was running to the exhibition ending in a final picture of a horizon with many children's hands, referring to them building the future. It was not Maikawa's intention to explicitly show Japan through these objects or these pictures, but rather show the way towards a new humanism, embracing both the old traditions of the West and East and the young tradition of modernism and overcome it. He wanted to restore the beauty of the daily and give new worthiness to the daily. Also in other pavilions, in Expo 58, this attitude was present, but nowhere as pure as in the Japanese one. Leaving the pavilion, one could enjoy the restaurant along the pond. And at night, the pavilion was laying there as a bird just landed with open wings in a serene way, not attracting people, but silent, silently waiting to be discovered. Thank you.